Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 109, recorded December 7th, 2011. Adapt or die. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Omnia Audio and the new Omnia 11 audio processor. Big market radio engineers are calling it effortlessly loud. Check it out at omniaaudio.com slash 11. Hello, it's time for This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack. Glad that you're along. And if you're new to the show, this is the show where we talk about all things that have to do with radio technology. And that in includes hobbies like amateur radio, ham radio, uh, maybe a little pirate radio from time to time. Uh, mostly we talk about legal radio stuff that is running licensed radio stations. And we talk about the audio technology of uh, you know getting audio from here to there, recording it and, and capturing it and processing it and transmitting it. And then uh, you know, transmitter technology, RF stuff, too. So if it has to do with radio, we'll probably touch on it. We invite you to join us uh, in the chat room at uh, irc.twit.tv. You can join right in there, give yourself a screen name, and uh, holler at us or you know, talk amongst yourselves. Um, we have uh, a co-host with us, the infamous Ninjaneer from Muckwanago, Wisconsin. It's Chris Tarr. Hey, Chris. Ahoy, matey. <laughs> Chris, tell us about yourself. Why are you the Ninjaneer? Uh, well, you know, I, I kind of earned that from because I, I just tend to appear and fix things at random. You have something broke, there's a good chance if you turn around, I'll be standing right there ready to fix it. Uh, I'm the director of engineering for Intercom's radio stations in Milwaukee and Madison. Uh, I'm also a, a contributing writer for Radio Guide magazine. Uh, I run the uh, the website, uh, the virtual engineer at broadcastengineering.info. And you can find me tootling about the states uh, wherever there's broke radio. <laughs> cool. And, uh, you know, I, I used to do that, too. I used to run around and fix a lot of radio stations. And I don't know, I just wasn't good enough at it. I, I, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't make a good living at it. Um, I was a contract engineer for a while, but now I work for the folks at Telos, Omnia, and Axia, uh, also known as the Telos Alliance. And I've been working there for about 11 years and, and just delighted to be there. And in fact, I'm, I'm so delighted that uh, they even sponsor the show. By the way, we're happy to have other sponsors. Uh, contact the Twit Network if you too would like to be a sponsor of the show. I'm sure they'd be glad to to put you on and and uh, have us talk about you to the rather niche audience that we talk to, and that is broadcast engineers and other audio nuts around the world. All right, on this show, episode number 109. Uh, we have a terrific guest, a gentleman who I have known for some years and always had a great deal of respect for, and that is a gentleman named Terry Bond. Hi, Terry. How are you? Welcome hey, in. Hey, how, how are you this afternoon? This afternoon, this evening, whatever time it is where you are. I'm doing good. Fine. Tell us. A, now, I, Terry, seems like when I met you, you were doing um, a lot of contract engineering work. I had a company called Criterion. Yes, right? absolutely. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my career, as with most radio engineers, has been uh, lengthy and varied. Uh, to put it politely, um, I was I started out working for stations, uh, and essentially after doing a couple of director of engineering stints at a couple of places, uh, reconstituted my business and was uh, contract engineering for about five or six years. Uh, enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I, en I enjoyed the people as much as I enjoyed the equipment, and it was a it was a fun way to make a living. Um, Currently, I'm the Director of Engineering and Operations uh, for the Wisconsin Educational Communications Board, which uh, holds licenses for five TVs and about uh, 16 radios in uh, Wisconsin, and is also partners with the University of Wisconsin in Wisconsin Public Television and Wisconsin Public Radio. So uh, that's where I am currently. Uh, still, um, still active in SBE, although I'm kind of between chapters now that I've moved to Janesville. Uh, I still have my, ma my membership in the Milwaukee chapter. The Madison guys keep trying to get me to join the Madison chapter, but I've been too many years with Milwaukee to give it up at this point. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah. so. laughs> Those guys in Madison are tricky. You, you got to watch they those are, guys. They are very, they're very <laughs> persuasive, and it, it's a great chapter. Don't get me wrong. It's a wonderful chapter, and I've been to several of the meetings. But uh, for me, it's, it's just a little difficult to give up that hold of being an, in the Milwaukee chapter since uh, 19, uh, <clears throat> yes, whatever it's been. So, uh, <laughs> uh, still, so, on the, uh, still on the certification committee for the SPE. Oh, yeah 
which I which I enjoyed tremendously, and uh, currently just finishing up uh, the writing of the questions for our new certification level, which is going to be CBNE, which is uh, the Computer Broadcast uh, Network Engineering. So that'll be kind of an interesting. Uh, that's going to be an be. extension of the CBNT that we already have. Uh, this is going to be the engineering level, the next level up, uh, with emphasis on uh, IT as it as it is involved and evolving in broadcast engineering. So that's you kind know, of interesting too. This may be actually a good subject to 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 kick our conversation off with, and and that we've never spent much time on this show talking about certification, and, it, and certainly in lots of other. Uh, endeavors, uh, uh, practices, and professions, there are levels of certification to indicate that you know what you're doing in some area, maybe a niche area, maybe a broad area. Uh, I had the distinct pleasure of, of uh, our SBE chapter here in Nashville. Uh, uh, in fact, as I recall, Terry, we we hired you to come down and teach us, didn't I, we? I think you did. I think, I think I went so. Down, and then, you, and the, then uh, you... Right. And then you we proctored gave the, test. the test. Right. That's right. right. And, and I got my CBNT, but now it's expired. So well, I need to. That was a mistake. So I, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. that, sorry for that. But no, I'm sorry you uh, let it expire, but you can always take the test again. Oh, you should really wait and take the new one and the higher level. I think you'd find that one more interesting. Yeah, actually, uh, I took the, I, I did a beta test of that one a couple of months ago. Of the yes, new, you did. Uh, and I saw you scores, as a matter of fact. So there you go. Yeah, no, you, 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 yeah, you, you, as you can tell, I beta tested it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you know, I, I'm excited about We're it. I, I think to... it's. Uh... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was, you know, I, I was. Uh, I think it's fantastic. I'm really excited, uh, waiting for it to come out. Uh, you know, the CBNT, I think, sometimes got a little maligned just because it it was created so long ago, and technology has changed. And uh, I think this one is a really good representation of what a lot of uh, IT and engineering types run into uh, in, in broadcast stations. I thought a lot of the questions were just spot on, so I can't wait for it to come out so I can go and rush out and take it right away. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, when we put the CBNT together, and that was about no, let's see, when would that have been? Probably about uh, 1995, 96, somewhere back in that range. Uh, it was really put together because SBE saw how the IT side of broadcast engineering was going to become very, very big, uh, and we had a lot of folks out there who either were non-believers. Or said, uh, "I'm not going to. I'm not going to bother learning that stuff." Just as we had in our industry, unfortunately, people who said, "I'm not learning that transistor stuff," and I'm certainly not learning that digital electronics stuff. And we saw what happened there. So what we were trying to do was simply provide a certification level that would help uh, stay in the industry, but perhaps didn't really have the background they they were going to need in the future. And the CBNT really helped bridge that gap. Uh, about two years ago, we, we pretty significantly uh, upgraded that examination and, and brought it up to date because it had fallen behind in several areas. But still, it remains a entry-level certification. So but from that standpoint, it needed to be something that was going to be relatively uh, accessible to folks who, who wanted to take an exam. Uh, the CBNE, as you pointed out, is the next step up. And uh, I'm glad you took that test, and I'm glad the other folks, I think we had three or four who took the beta test. Um, I was surprised to find out that we didn't have a lot of folks that did really well on that test, including some folks like yourself, Chris, that we expected to do well, which simply meant that our questions were getting, were too hard. They were just, either they were too hard or they weren't on topic. So after we got all those beta tests uh, results back, uh, we went back and looked at the question database. Uh, figuring out which questions were missed the most by everybody and took a look at those to see is this question wrong is it bad is it inappropriate or what what's the problem with this question because people had oh, so many people missed it so we took those questions and massaged them either to improve them or in some cases to throw them out of the exam uh, because it just it obviously was a question people just weren't getting so um, I feel that we're pretty close now. I think we're going to have another round of beta tests uh, beginning in a week or two. And uh, hopefully the idea is we'd like to get this thing really out uh, in the first quarter of next year. Uh, again, I can't promise it's going to be by NAB because we tried to do that last year and we didn't make it for sure. But we're a lot closer to possibly making it this year. So I'd look for a release of the final tests sometime in the first quarter of, of uh, 2012. But... Um, Unlike the, the other certification, this is actually an engineering certification. 
And so, as a result, not only is it a little harder, but there's an essay question that we have added on the end. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the way SBE does essay questions on cert exams, you don't just get one question to, to choose from. We give you three, and you get to choose the one that you want to answer. And the three questions are chosen based upon your uh, application for the exam in which you highlight your technical uh, skills and experience over the years. So, for example, uh, in, a, in a standard television uh, certification test, for example, if you said you were a, uh, you had been a studio engineer all of your career, we probably would not give you a transmitter exam question. We'd give you something that would be related to studio work. And vice versa, if you were at the transmitter for your entire career, we probably weren't going to be asking you a lot about studio switches and that kind of stuff. So we do listen to what you put on those exam applications. And from those, we choose the essay question for you. So uh, from that standpoint, you should feel a little bit better about that because you're not going to be getting a question that's completely outside your area of expertise uh, once, you, once you get to that test. But the, the addition of the, uh, the essay question allows you to become a little more free in a response and a chance for you to show off what you know. Sometimes with multiple choice tests, people say, you know, you can't really multiple choice test except to know what is wrong, you know, and pick the right one out of the three. Uh, that's not such a hard thing to do, but to really be able to express yourself in terms of an essay where you, you actually get a chance to put pen to paper and say, you know, I know this and here's how this should work and here's how we do this kind of thing. That's the purpose of the essay exam. So we're uh, real excited about the CBNE. And as I said, I, I would hope for first quarter of next year, although I can't promise that. But we have one more round of beta tests and probably a little <coughs> bit more polishing. And then hopefully we'll be ready to go. So that's that. Terry, I, this is a topic that you wanted to talk about, and that that uh, broadcast engineers uh, have, have got to make a move into, into more IT centric world. And and we'll we'll, we'll get to that. I, somebody in the chat room is suggesting that perhaps uh, another new certification from SB is needed. That would be the uh, CVTE. Oh, for video. No, the, 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 the certified uh, vacuum tube engineer. <laughs> vacuum tube. Well, <laughs> there's not much call for those guys except in high-end audio work these days. But, yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, that's another thing that uh, is interesting about this business. Um, and it kind of provides a framework of what, what I really kind of wanted to talk about tonight in a larger scale, which is all of us got into this business because we liked something about the idea of broadcast engineering. Either we liked fixing things, or like Chris who fixes anything he can find evidently that happens to show up, uh, which is great. And it's a great talent to be able to do that. Or we were attracted to the, the showbiz elements of broadcasting, maybe a little bit, sort of like the, the guy who cleans up after the elephants in, in the circus, you know, it's, it's showbiz after all. Um, or perhaps it was something that grew out of a hobby, whether it was, uh, you know, ham radio, good good uh, choice there or perhaps uh, professional audio whatever there's a lot of reasons we came into this business and when we did come into this business all of us sort of looked at what we were going to do with this career that we were starting and sort of froze it in time at that point because that was the business we were going into and i think the really important thing to remember about that is that broadcast engineering isn't a static business it's not the same skill set from year to year to year. And if you're in the business only because you enjoy aligning tape cartridge machines, which you had plenty of work to do back in the 70s, uh, oh, yeah. and no work to do today, uh, you're, got, you're going to be a little disappointed in the, in, in, the, in the industry. And if you never learned anything in tape cartridge machines, uh, you're going to have problem moving forward. So sometimes we kind of get trapped into the skills that we know and learned early on. Um, a lot of folks in this industry leave at critical junctures of technology change because mm -hmm. they don't mm -hmm. want to go to the next level. And, yeah. and a prime example of that is the dividing line between transistors and tubes. Now, when I got into this business, there was there were both we had we well, there was still tube equipment in studios not not much but mostly consoles that they hadn't felt like replacing yet but transistors were pretty much there and there were a lot of engineers who said i'm not going to learn this transistor stuff i i don't need to do that i've you know two in other words they were fixated on tubes when they got loved that they knew and they were challenged 
not not encouraged by a yeah. transition. And that's yeah. where SBE, I think, is so valuable because it helps to try to bridge those transitions, just like we did with the CBN, CBNT, which is trying to cross over into the IT realm. So we all kind of get fixated that way. And unfortunately, it's sometimes even, even folks who've been in the industry a long time sort of go, oh, well, things were so much easier, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and, you know, this was that, and then we only had one station to worry about, and now we have a cluster of 12 that I'm taking care of. Uh, but times change, and we move on with them. And it's important to remember, I think, that we're not in the broadcasting business. We're really not. We are in the delivery business. <clears throat> now think about that for a minute. What does a delivery do? What, is it, what, what does UPS do? Okay, you got something you got and you got something you want to send to somebody else. So what do you do? You call up UPS and what do they do? They come and they pick up your package and they deliver it, hopefully unmangled, probably not the way UPS is these days. But in any case, they, they deliver your package, they transport it and take it to its uh, delivery point. And what you've got there are two customers of that delivery system. You've got the person who sends the package and you've got the person who receives the package. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be UPS and you want to make money, you've got to satisfy both customers. If you don't satisfy both customers, the delivery has been unsuccessful. You haven't actually delivered it the way you needed to. And, and yeah. I, I think I challenge you to think of our business like that. Mm -hmm. What we do isn't so much about radio as we think of radio. With, trans, with, with big transmitters and studios, et cetera, et cetera, as it is in connecting or delivering content distantly. That's what we do. And sometimes we do it with tubes and transistors, and sometimes we do it on the Internet. Sometimes we do it in ways we probably haven't imagined yet. But essentially, we're in that business. We're in that delivery business. And we think of it as the broadcasting business because that's what it was when we got into it. But like the railroads who realized way too late that they were in the transportation business, not the railroad business. Mm -hmm. That is exactly the, the situation, I think, that broadcast engineers have put themselves in occasionally. And that we try, one of the things I'm trying to do is, is get us out of that thinking that just because we're changing the mode of delivery that we should lose our interest in being the delivery conduit because there's lots of ways to deliver things back and forth. It seems like there's a common element uh, when you start talking about we're in the, the delivery business and, it, and we need to be sure that we're open to learning about these other ways of, of delivering content. A, a common theme to all of that is indeed the content. So I, right. I would add that we're also part of the content creation business. Right. Most right. engineers uh, work uh, both in a studio environment and a transmission environment. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, you know, content creation is, is an important part of that, just like actually, you know, having gasoline to take the truck from one point to the other for the UPS people is part of, as part of the delivery process, an, an integral part of the delivery process, even though it's not normally seen uh, by other folks. So, so that's kind of, a, kind of my take on a lot of things. Um, I'm also very interested in working with engineers to understand a little bit more about how they can interface better, how we can interface better with the people we work with on both sides of the delivery process, both the people we work for at, at the station level and the people we, we deliver to on the listener level. I think that we have this a little bit insular uh, characteristic, you know, the old curmudgeonly engineer. Uh, you know, let's, let, he fixes things all the time, but, you know, you don't want to invite him to the Christmas party, that's for sure. And uh, otherwise, we don't want to see him at the staff meetings. And, and you know, that was kind of the way engineers were looked at for a long, long time. And I think uh, we need to think about how we can change that. If I could uh, divert, divert, uh, divert just a little bit to talk about the beginning of engineering, I'm not going to talk about the beginning of broadcasting, but, you know, <laughs> the idea of, of content delivery, if you really want to think about it, it can go back to uh, the 6th century B.C. when they built that, that you've seen the, the, the famous Greek temple, the semicircle temple built into the hill and the stones. Right, right. I mean, think about that for a minute. What was that? That was an engineering project. Somebody, some, some boss guy 
in, in Greece said to somebody, you know, I'd be a lot more effective getting my message out if we could do these, these presentations in front of a lot more people. <laughs> so mm -hmm. let's build something that does that. And some engineer, some broadcast engineer type in the 6th century BC came and said, well, you know, if we, I bet since you know how echoes work, I'll bet if we built this thing into the side of a hill and had people sit there and then had sort of a focus point a little farther up in the front and mm -hmm. you, if you were there, I'll bet you, you know, they could hear you better. And the guy probably said, well, that's, that's pretty far out. That's, that's, that's pretty interesting stuff. And anyway, after having a few, few hundred slaves probably building the thing, you know, that was an engineering project because it was somebody thinking, how do I fix this delivery issue? And then proceeding to do it. And so, you know, this, this business we're in isn't anything new. I mean, you can take it back to that level. It's essentially fixing, wanting to, to get something from one place to another and how you do that and all the stuff that's involved in that. So I think it, it's sometimes good to think about that. You know, when the, when the, I'm sure that when the first broadcast engineers were developed, and the first person called a broadcast engineer a date on that, but certainly it had to have been somewhere in the, uh, you know, post, slightly post-Marconi era. They thought radio was that era, and that's what it was. It was, you know, it was Morse code, or it was very crude, you know, carbon microphones and playing records over, pl over the air through, you know, Victrola records over the air through a microphone. That was broadcasting, and that was state-of-the-art, and that was cool, and that's what they did. Um, think about that, and you think, oh, that was such old-fashioned stuff. I mean, how could they have? Well, it wasn't old-fashioned to them, was it? I mean, yeah. it was yeah. state-of-the-art. Yeah. State-of-the-art. And that's the thing to remember is everything is always state-of-the-art for you. Yeah, it certainly is, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it really it's is. Certain. I mean, yeah. you're, you're kind of trapped in this moving timeline, and you're going, but as you go, you take everything with you as down that timeline. So mm -hmm. engineers tend to be fixated a little bit, I think, in the time where they really feel they got their first professional job, and that's kind of how it starts out, and boy, God, that's you my know, advantage that, actually, from now on. That, that's, a, that's a really good subject, that, that if, we could, if we could understand and explore that and, and help it, it almost doesn't matter which profession, whether you're a doctor and what you learned at medical school is, is the way it is. And it's a little difficult to learn new ideas, which are happening all the time in the medical profession, uh, or whether you... Um whether you're a broadcast engineer. And like you said, if you grew up, if you came into broadcasting in the era of tube consoles, um, that's kind of what, that's your comfort level. And as you mentioned, there were a certain number of engineers who didn't want to make the jump to transistors. And there were, uh, th that was a little bit before my time, but certainly I had contemporary engineers who didn't want to make the jump into computers. Mm -hmm. And, th and th those engineers often you know, had a computer they never turned on or they didn't have a computer, and yet they were charged with, you know, keeping track of or maintaining the, the accounting system computer uh, or, or the billing department and then the, the sales department's uh, 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 computers, and that they really had a hard time moving into that world. Uh, I guess I, I guess I was always kind of enthused about computers, uh, you know, bought my first uh, Vic, uh, borrowed my first Vic 20 and stayed up all night, you know, playing with it in the, uh, and, and the little floppy drive that came with it. Um, how, how do we I mean, are, are, I mean, should we worry and try to um, try to create an environment where people can make these transitions when these sea changes happen? And can't you imagine, uh, well, there are stations right now that are lagging behind in terms of uh, being able to, to get their content uh, in methods other than over the air, over an AM or FM transmitter. Uh, Chris Tarr, I think, is pretty much on the on the cutting edge of this. Uh, uh, every bit as much as a, a forward-thinking company like his employer, Intercom, will, will let him be. Uh, but then there are other uh, engineers, including myself, who, yeah, we got a little basic things going here, but haven't made more of, of the jump. Um, uh, Chris, uh, let me ask Chris Tarr if, if you could address this for just a second, and then I want to hear Terry's thoughts on, on you know, the big picture of helping engineers get through this, or is this a natural attrition happens everywhere and we just need to let it be? Chris? Well, that, I, that's a good question, and I, I think that's a concern of SBE. I, mean, I was also on the board for a while, and we've had those discussions of, you know, where, where are the engineers coming from and where are they going? And I, I think one of the upsides that we're seeing now with kind of the new generation that's coming in, there's not many of us, but, uh, you know, a lot of us are naturally curious and we're, we're kind of, you know, really came of age in the computer age. And so it's not necessarily 
transmitters or computers or things like that that, that kind of uh, pique our interest. It's technology. And, and for example, I love anything, tech, you know, any, any kind of technology I can get my hands on, I love. Uh, you know, HD radio was great. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I work on everything from a, a 19... Uh, late 1950, early 1960 AM transmitter to uh, a digital transmitter now that does HD, you know, and, and everything in between. And I love it all. And, uh, you know, I think that, um, I, you know, there are some people that, that are, are all, you know, starting to get close to retirement age in the business that have pretty much said, you know, I, I, I'm not going to go down that road. Uh, you know, I'm going to stick with transmitters. I'm going to stick with the tubes. And, you know, I, I really don't want to get put that investment in to learn this 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 new technology and continue on so uh, you know I, I think the difficulty we have is is though is is some people who aren't interested in these other things getting them there and how do we do it and uh, I think some of the the certifications that, that SBE offers encourages that uh, you know in order to get these certifications you have to learn these technologies and uh, one of the reasons why I have all those certifications that I have is I enjoy it. I, I, I don't, you know, I personally, career-wise, at least for now, I've been at this, with the same employer for eight years. I'm not going anywhere. So the certifications, uh, you know, it's not like I'm getting these to go find another job or, or to, to do anything else other than I enjoy the challenge of learning new things and, and, and testing myself on these new things. And uh, I think that uh, that's one of the great things about SBE certification is, it's going to push the people who are kind of on that precipice one way or another. If you're going to go for these certi uh, certifications, you're going to need to do this. It's just part of getting that certification. So, um, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, long, long story short, uh, you know, long story short, that's, uh, you know, the, the change is always happening. And, you know, there are the type of people who look back and long for the way that things were done. And, and, you know, and, and remember that and try to hang on to that. And then there are others who look forward to the future. And I, I got to be honest, you know, as I, I travel around and, and meet, uh, you know, engineering managers and station managers, I, I seem to think there's a lot more of us now that are looking forward to the future than there are holding on to the past. Mm. Mm. Terry, That's and I, I, just, I just had a thought moving back to, back to you, Terry, is that you and I were talking before the show. Uh, you mentioned to me, any brain cells of yours, Kirk, who, who, any brain cells of yours that know about how to fix a cart machine, those are pretty useless to you right now. And that's, I think that's part of what people fear, whether it's in broadcasting, medicine, or any profession, is fear of, well, if I move on to this, if this new thing happens and I got to move to, then what about all that work I put in before? What about the, the hundreds of hours? Well, all right, in several hundred dollars that I made fixing cart machines. But what about my knowledge of a cart machine? I can never use that. Oh, that's a, it, does it bother me? Well, not very often, but now that I think about it, I'm getting a little pissed. <laughs> All that knowledge Wait. of fixing ITC machines and, and others. <laughs> I wish I could put Wait. that to work. You know, Kirk, it's interesting that you, that you say that because it, it is true. I, I think that one of the things that engineers do, and I include, my, I include myself in this, in this uh, roll call of, of what I, I'm going to say, is we tend to personalize the job. We tend to take those skills and make those our value. And so then when those skill sets change, like the cart machine, it's like a piece of our value has gone. And do we then replace it with something moving on, which is the right thing to do? Or do we say, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm, you know, if I can't, if I can't use my existing skill set, then I'm going to do something else or I'm going to, I'm going to retire or, or whatever. So I, I think we tend to personalize the job. I mean, you know, what engineer who's listening or viewing this right now hasn't felt on top of the world after a particularly tough night of fixing a transmitter problem when you walk out the door and it's on the air and you turn on the radio when you get in the car and you know that it's back on because you fixed it. Oh yeah. That's, that's, that's a high. <laughs> That's a high. That and if you take that away, you say, okay, well, we're no, you know, we don't need that anymore. We don't need a tube transmitter. It's that complicated. We have a solid state transmitter now, and we have two of them. If one blows up, we, we, we pull the modules out and send them back, and we use the other transmitter. All of a sudden, you've lost that sense of being able to conquer that problem. And, and so if, if you're a kind of person that does tend to personalize your skill set, that's, that's a really tough thing to do. Uh, uh, quite a few folks, another, digit, another, another transition point 
especially for the TV folks, of course, came a couple of years ago at the digital transition. I can't tell you how many TV engineers I talked to who said, I'm not going to do this. This is like, you know, what? You know, what? this transmitter is going away and now we've got a whole new system to do this and it's digital and I have to learn all this, start, start to learn all of this IT type stuff because this is all based on that. A lot of folks said, no, it was just another, another transition point. Um, mm. The folks like Chris, who, who are in love with the idea of the technology, not with the specific technology, uh. will stay and will continue. And those are the folks that will be able to make those transitions, whatever they are. At some point, I think, in a lot of, a lot of, a lot of us, at some point in our careers, say, okay, the knowledge level is full. I'm done. I've been filled up, and I'm done. And so now I'm going to just continue to use this base to earn a living. And we can't do that. That's not going to work because, as I said earlier, you know, go back to the 6th century B.C., go back to Marconi, go back to the, the radio in the 30s, go back to television in the 50s. They're all unique and they're all encapsulated. And if we choose to stay in that capsule, we can't move forward. And that's why I think the SBE is really so important because, as Chris pointed out, too, with the certification program, it gives you the tools to learn, to reach and go to a next level. If perhaps you're not comfortable yet, all right, you study for a certification. If, if you really don't know anything at all about computers, and believe me, we had quite a few folks back in 1996 and 97 who really hadn't done anything with computers that were broadcast engineers. You know, that gave them the, the right to start moving in that direction if they wanted to and continue their careers. So I, I think those transition points are the ideal positions for us to start introducing the new technology as it goes forward. Um, one other thing I'd like to, uh, to bring up, too, is everything affects everything. We all know that as engineers. Everything does affect everything. You turn a screw here, it does affect something somewhere else in the universe, but, uh, if not locally. But th there is a convergence where we are seeing uh, the, uh, the broadcast side of our business, the broadcast engineering, the traditional broadcast engineering side of the business, either facing the decision of either accepting the IT knowledge experience and, and using it, or being replaced by that particular IT knowledge experience. Uh, for example, I, one of the things I keep, uh, keep an eye on in some of the, uh, on the internet things, some websites and, and blogs and whatnot, um, there is a, uh, a wonderful site that I saw last week, and it ha it's an IT site. And believe it or not, they had on there, and some of you may have seen this, it's really great, 10 drawbacks to working in IT, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force you to listen to these 10, and I'm not going to say anything. This is what IT people were saying, 10 reasons you, you don't want to be in IT. All Number right. one, All right. the hours are long. Number mm -hmm. two, your personal time will be interrupted. Number three, you have to deal with a lot of angry people. Number four, your work tends to be deadline driven. Number five, people expect you to fix their home computers. Number six, people lie to you all the time. Number seven, you have to keep your education current. Number eight, things don't always work the way they're supposed to. Number nine, you may have to deal with a lot of bureaucracy. And number 10, and most interesting of all, your job is to make yourself obsolete. Now, is that written for broadcasters or was that written for IT people? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. You tell me. You tell me. <laughs> I mean, one of the things was, and I, the, the, when the split happened uh, between IT and, and what we think of as traditional broadcast engineering, one of the things was, well, those IT people, you know, they work nine to five, and, you know, they don't have to come in in the middle of the night and, and, and do anything unless it's a backup of system, and then they can just shut it down and work on it, and they don't have to worry about having it back up until the next morning, and they never get called for emergencies, and blah, 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 blah. Well, it appears that the uh, same job pressures that we, uh, we had experienced and continue to experience are now being felt by our brethren who are totally in the IT side alone. So what does that tell you? What does that really say? Uh, does that mean we've met the enemy and he is us? 
does it mean that these guys are finally starting to realize their job is more involved than they thought? And just like we always knew that it was going to be harder than we thought, now they're seeing that it's harder than they thought. Or, or is this really just a way for us to see that we've had some kind of a merger here between these two industries, uh, the traditional broadcast engineering industry and the IT industry, in, in, in such a way that we're pretty much the same, except for our skill sets. So what does that mean for the future? Think about that for a minute. Hmm. Well, let's think about that while Anybody we hear from our sponsor. Anybody want to think about sponsor. that for a minute? Yeah. <laughs> okay. How about we think about that while we hear from our sponsor, and we'll, okay. we'll come right back on that note. Chris Tarr, you get ready with a salient response, okay? Okay. Okay. All right. Hey, our show is brought to you by This Week in Radio Tech, is brought to you this week by uh, my employer and my friends uh, at Omnia Audio, including the Omnia Audio development team. Some of those guys are uh, Frank Foti who's been doing this for a long time. You know, Frank Foti, what, what, is, what is the difference between an Omnia processor and just about every other one out there? And I'm, I do want to give some kudos to Orban because uh, uh, Bob Orban's going to be on our show next week, and Bob Orban is the same kind of ears-listening guy uh, that you'll find Frank Foti is. But let me tell you about Frank. Frank listens to tens of thousands of hours of music and talk through whatever processor, whatever new algorithm he's working on. Uh, there were people, a few years ago, at 2101 Superior Avenue in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, up on the fourth floor, there were people who got so sick and tired of hearing the same four seconds of a Shania Twain song going, th going through the, uh, the newest uh, uh, algorithms. Oh my goodness, uh, Frank, shut the door. Listening to audio through an audio processor is absolutely critical. And the reason is, you, 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 sure, you can design an audio processor just based on math. You can take textbook compressor algorithms and textbook limiters and textbook uh, um, clippers and a textbook uh, preemphasis circuit and build yourself an audio processor. But it ain't going to sound like squat compared to the processors that Omnia is building. Why is that? Because audio is something that is perceived. Is you know if look if you're building well there's all kinds of things that work this way but if if you're building something that that tickles your ears that your brain is perceiving you've got to test it over and over and over again and that's what audio engineers do and that's what the guys at, at Omnia do Frank Foti is there Cornelius Gould we've had Corny on this show before Corny's the same kind of guy listen to the same passage that's maybe giving a little trouble or he wants to correct a way that the algorithm is working listen to that thing over and over and over again and obsess about how the audio sounds going through this algorithm. Hey, should we try something else? Should we, should we try a little feed forward action here? Should we try some feedback action? Should we increase the, the release time? Should we come up with a dual speed release? Should we uh, freeze the, the gating right at this point? All these different aspects and even more that, that guys like Frank and Corny have access to, you know, backdoor type of stuff in, in the algorithms. Then you've got an engineer at, at, uh, at Omnia named Rob Dye. Rob is an absolute expert at coding. This guy can take code that comes out of an automated process and hone it down, uh, 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 whittle it down to its essential components and make that, uh, make that code run super fast, like it has got to run. You know, when you're dealing with audio processing that's running at a sampling rate of over 700 kilohertz so it's doing 700,000 operations per second on some uh, high-end audio in, in, in a clipper section and that's the kind of work they're doing Rob Dye is able to get that to run super fast uh, on, on today's uh, on, on today's DSP processors then you add to that a guy like Mark Manolio at the at Omnia Mark he is, he does engineering. Uh, he does it on the side, and we encourage that. Uh, he also tries out our latest processors on his uh, contract stations. And Mark is also a tech support guy. You need a little help with an Omnia processor, getting it to sound just right. You know, preset is close, but it's not quite the way you want. You contact Mark Manolio and Omnia support, and he's going to be able to walk you through it, ask you what you're looking for, and make suggestions as to how to get that processor to sound just right. I want to encourage you to go to the Omnia Audio website. It's omniaaudio.com. And check out the, the range of processors there. We've got everything from the Omni 11, absolute top of the line, incredible new technology. It's, it's really, it's, it's winning people's hearts and ears all over the world. Many cities, wish I, could, <laughs> wish I could mention some of the latest ones, but we're under a little bit of a non-disclosure on a few of them. Uh, Paris, where Leo is, yeah, there's, uh, there's Omni 11 at the Eiffel Tower now. Um, uh, maybe I wasn't supposed to say that. 
anyway, um, uh, really, we, we have shipped uh, hundreds of these things all over the world, and engineers are just loving them. The Omni 11, the Omni 9, which is now shipping. This is the creation of Leif Clayson. Uh, a lot of you have seen Leif uh, on this show talking about some of the technologies there, like the undo and the declipper technology that can take uh, CDs that are really a little overprocessed and clipped and turn them into something worth processing and making them sound good. Uh, on the air. And then there's the Omnia 1. There's over 5,000 of those on the air now around the world. The Omnia 8X, eight processors in one box, and the Omnia AXE, which is uh, the uh, 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 program that runs on a PC, does Omnia processing and stream encoding. And we're going to give away one of those Omnia AXEs at the end of the show. Check it out on the web, please. OmniaAudio.com. Appreciate your visiting there. Request a catalog. While you're on the site, we'll send you a catalog. You can read all about the processors and check out the white papers, too. A lot of good info there on the white papers. Thank you very much, Omnia Audio, for sponsoring today's show. All right. Uh, we are talking with uh, Terry Bond, who is uh, our guest. And one of the things I like about Terry is he's, he's able to really raise the level of the conversation about broadcast engineering and get us to think a little bit about what we're doing and how we're doing it, how we're accomplishing our job and how we're presenting ourselves as professionals. Uh, for a lot of us, you know, started out as frankly, I started out as a, uh, I don't know, I didn't seem to have a professional attitude. And, you know, through some hard knocks and then hearing and reading some things that Terry Bond wrote uh, some years ago, kind of opened my eyes to being, to having a, the attitude of a professional uh, in this profession of broadcast engineering. And I think it certainly helped me. Chris, was there a question on the table that you were going to, to answer, Chris Tarr? No, oh. I don't think there was. <laughs> oh, we, 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 had a, we had a homework assignment uh, from Terry, and I was so busy yapping about Omnia. Terry, you want to re repeat the assignment or, or give us a summation <laughs> oh, no, there? No. no, actually, I was just saying, uh, when, you, when, you, when you thought about that list that I read uh, <clears throat> 20 minutes ago, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. the, the, uh, the thing that I find is interesting is that isn't this exactly what we say about ourselves? Exactly. Those same issues. Uh, you know, you're on call. You have you have to deal with a lot of mad people. Uh, you have work is deadline driven. People expect you to fix their home equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, if you just ask those questions or said those statements, I think that nine out of ten people would say, "Yeah, we're talking about broadcast engineers." Well, sure. Well, I mean, there's, are, that's uh, yeah, you know, that's that's a, that's a great example about how uh, you know the IT world has made that sea change. Uh, you right. know, what used to be. You know, kind of help desk stuff, support stuff, technical support, real easy stuff has become mission critical 24-7 operation, just like radio has. So it doesn't surprise me to hear these things. It doesn't surprise me to see these things because their industry is much aligned with ours. They're technicians just like we are. Uh, you know, and their business has moved from kind of their early years now to uh, where it's become a very critical part of our infrastructure. And those things need to be handled 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it actually doesn't surprise me too much to see that list and, and having it sound a lot like one of ours. Yeah, it does sound a lot like one of ours. And uh, it makes you wonder if, uh, in fact, what is happening here is, is already started a transition between us and them, if you will. Uh, that, in fact, with them moving closer to seeing their jobs the way we do and are moving closer to seeing IT as being a delivery portion of our, uh, of our particular jobs, perhaps there really is going to be much more of a melding of, of, the, of the two industries. Um, you know, there are some things that are unique about broadcast engineers as opposed to, to other engineers. And one of the things that I, I find interesting is uh, if you ask a bunch of engineers what it is they like the most, about being a broadcast engineer. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll tell you about five or six things and most of them will be the same. The first thing they'll tell you is it's fun and, and it's fun to sort of get into something, it's challenging, it's, it's fun to focus your attention on fixing something and actually getting that accomplishment when you get it fixed. And then that's true I think of all of us. Um, we enjoy being able to set our own priorities. For example, you've got your list at the beginning of the day. Some things need to be fixed. Something needs to be changed. Something needs to be reinstalled. But you get to set that priority. No one's going to tell you you've got to do that first. At least not usually. Uh, so it's kind of fun to have that kind of freedom. And if you can't get, to the, can't get to it today, figure out a way to make it tomorrow and get it done. That's nice to have that freedom. Um, and, and there's a variety of things we do. I mean, you can laugh all you want about changing fluorescent light bulbs or unplug, unplugging toilets. 
uh, the point is, the job does have a lot of non-broadcast or non-engineering assignments at a lot of places. We become sort of the, the building superintendent, if you will, that uh, does that as, as a sideline from doing the engineering work. So it, it's not too unusual for that to happen. Um, we also enjoy the fact that we can sort of throw all our attention at something when we want to. We don't have to, we don't have to stop and say, oh, 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 I'm, I have to stop to do this now. If, if we're off the air and we need to get back on the air, there's nobody that's going to tell us, oh, you really want to do that now? I'd really much rather you would fix my t TV set here because it's got a problem. That's not going to happen because you know what your job is to do and, and how you need to get it done. But if you look at the way our jobs are from the manager's side, a lot of the things that we think are benefits are not benefits. They're detriments as the way they look at it. For example, we say, well, we, we enjoy that ability to be able to set our own priorities and, and to do things in the middle of the night when we have to. And managers will say, well, you know, um, they're never around when you need them, those engineers. They're just never there. I mean, they're at the transmitter. They're out getting parts. They're doing something back in the back room. I don't know what it is. I mean, those things that we like are oftentimes the things that managers don't get. And so because they don't get it, that becomes a negative. Like, all right, so you say, let's, let's take this to its logical conclusion. You mm -hmm. want somebody where? You say, they're never around when you need them. But when do you want me to be here? When do you need me? Well, uh, they can't answer that question. They can't answer it. They'll say, well, I need you when, when we need you. Well, yeah, you do. <laughs> that's exactly right. And who knows when that's going to be. So how can you say it's bad for me to be doing something else when you don't need me at this very second? So those things are kind of a tough situation. Uh, a lot of the things that the managers think are important, and, and, and really we kind of tend to slough off. Uh, you know, we're never there when they, when they think we're supposed to be there. Uh, we kind of spend our time in another world. Uh, we often spend a lot of time online, and it's not because we're, you know, Skyping people just for fun. It's because we're learning things online and we're looking up, or we're looking up specifications for a bid or we're trying to find out more about this latest piece of equipment that we've just heard about. There's a lot of things we do that have a connection, a very solid connection to the business. But as far as people who are not engineers are concerned, they don't. They don't see it. They don't see it that way at all. Uh, because the manager is looking through the lens of the sales department. And the sales department and the engineering department and the programming department are three very different areas. And it's a tough job to be a manager because all of those areas, those three, never seem to jibe completely straight on. They're always at an angle. And maybe it's time for us to try to figure that out rather than try to fight it all the time. Maybe it would be very cool for us to be the, the department that basically tries to bridge the other departments as, instead of trying to say, well, we're going to gather our forces and protect ourselves from those awful people in the programming department who, God forbid, are going to give me another remote tomorrow, or those awful people from the sales department who are always making me come in to fix, uh, to do a, to cut a spot at the last minute on Friday at 5 o'clock because this has to go on the air in 10 minutes and they didn't have the foresight to do that at lunchtime when they were here. So, I mean, all of those things come together in kind of a strange way to make us adversarial in the work, in the marketplace. And I don't think that we're going to get to, to come our way. So I think maybe what we have to do is try to go their way, to try to get them to understand what we do better. And furthermore, for us to be able to interface with them on an equals basis and not on a subordinate basis, as is the case at many stations. And how do you do that? Yeah, one how do things you do I that? Always tell, yeah, one of the things I always tell people is, uh, I get complaints, all these managers, they know they're so awful in the program department. Oh, God, what a bunch of jerks. And blah, blah, blah. I say, Let, tell me something. Do you, does, your, uh, does your station have a department head meetings? And they say, oh, yeah, we have those all the time. I said, do you go to those? Well, no. Well, why not? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I was never asked. Oh, so you're a department head because you had the engineering department, right? Well, yeah, I guess. Well, then why don't you say, hey, I need to be in on these meetings. It'll be useful. It'll be good for me so I understand what's going on. And it'll be good for you in case you have technical questions. And I said, no manager in the world is going to refuse you when you come at it from that direction. They're going to say, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. But until you get to the table with the other department heads, 
you're always going to be treading water. You're never going to be able to move yourself to the position of being recognized as an equal in that group. A lot of, and that's exactly where a lot of engineers go, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be part of that group. I, 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 don't, I don't feel comfortable with that group. You know, you know, I don't want to have to dress up to go to the meeting because they all wear suits and ties when they go to those meetings or, or at least they wear khakis or something. Uh, and, you know, and I'm usually, you know, I'm in blue jeans because I've been working at the transmitter all night. Okay, I got all of that and it's all true. However, you know, you could, you could actually have a, 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 a pair of uh, khakis uh, or dockers or whatever at the station that you could put on and put on a uh -huh. shirt and go to the meeting, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. I suppose. Well, okay, why don't you try that sometime? and see what happens. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You know, a, a, a lot of places just don't see engineering in the way we see it. And we're our, we're our own worst enemies by not giving them that information. At least that's why I look at it. You got to be proactive about the work you do because nobody will know if you don't. Why? Because everything is working because you fixed it all. And that's the way they think it is normally. And so they don't get what you do. And if the better the engineer you are, if you don't promote yourself, that you're going to be let go. Think Eventually, I, I think that's true. Yeah. The best engineers who don't communicate are going to be the first to be <laughs> let go. So, yeah. you know, we've got to learn to talk. We've got to learn to interface with other folks in the, in the departments and, and, and make it work. And, and that's one of the things I think that, you know, can only be done just through sheer willpower and, and, and you know, getting the courage up to say to the manager, hey, I'm a department head. I want to come to these meetings. I'll learn a lot and I'll, give, I'll be a valuable resource. So when they decide they're going to do a remote, you know, from a city that's uh, 20 miles away and there's a mountain between you, uh, maybe you can tell them that the Marty isn't going to work, you know, between the two points before they get to the point where they've sold the remote and you have one day to put the remote together. And, and then part of, being, part of being proactive would be coming to the manager's meeting or the department head meeting with a map and make a presentation. Hey, sales folks, right. I've mapped out all the areas where our Marty will work, if you're using Marty, uh, all our places where it will work. I've mapped out the places most likely where our Comrex access will work. And I've also mapped out, uh, you know, I've, here's a list of the businesses that are regular advertisers that I know have internet connections that they'll let us use if we want to use a, a wired, uh, uh, you know, IP uh, uh, remote solution. So being proactive about, hey, here's what will work. Uh, and, and let me encourage you to go sell these things uh, because we'll have a great time and it's going it's to work. If you can be proactive in that way, uh, man, that'll raise your stature in, enormously with, with the manager and, and the staff. Right. Exactly. And you see, there's a lot of ways to show value. And we think that we show value by doing a good job. And we do. But it's not that value that is seen by the people that need to see it. And so therefore we've got to show our value in other ways as well if we want to play the game. Because you know we have to be essentially managers of, of our own engineering department. Even if we're the only person on the staff and we're a chief engineer, you still are manager of that department. Whether, you're, whether your boss knows it or not, you're a department head. And so you might as well tell them, hey, I really am a department head. So let me, let me go to these meetings and let me, let me provide my valuable input because it is valuable on things you know like you know what where can we do remotes and what kind of remotes can we do uh you know what kind of what kind of production facilities do we need to change to make it better for you guys and the kind of spot requests or what kind of what kind of requests are you getting for production facilities if we don't have that stuff maybe we can figure out how to do that there's a lot there's just a, a ton of ways in which you can show value and all of that stuff works directly because unless we show value in times of belt tightening guess what happens yeah uh, the, the folks who aren't seen as being productive and it doesn't help us if we're seen as being a little curmudgeonly which we often are <laughs> and a little bit antisocial and a little bit living at the transmitter just a little bit not too much just a little bit uh <laughs> we all do that a little and i think that that's probably not the best way to approach things if we really want to keep a job uh, we've got we've got to learn to sell ourselves and what we do as a service and as a service that does cost something but provides a benefit and that's exactly the point we the manager will be very quick to tell you what what your services cost he'll know that and he'll think of that as being just money that goes out down the drain and therefore that's going to be the first thing i want to cut 
what we have to do is show him that the dollars spent in the maintenance of equipment and in, in having an, an engineering department that is actively involved in working with other department heads to produce income and revenue and listeners and viewers is a valuable investment, not an expense. Because if we're considered just an expense, we're going to be the first things to go. And that's sometimes the better engineers we've been, the longer it's going to take for things to blow up after we leave. And so that kind of reinforces them. In other words, you, you, you get fired because uh, of a, uh, you know, late, you get laid off because you, you know, you're costing the station too much money. And we just, we don't see the value there. And, you, and you've been really good at the station. You know what? That station's going to run itself for quite some time without you. And that's something that will happen. And they'll have the ability to say, see, we didn't need that engineer after all. Everything is just uh, clunk and down goes the transmitter. And now what do you do? Now, we, we can't unfortunately plan for those things to happen after we leave, but they will happen. Maybe not sooner, but they will happen later. And then it's going to be, well, we got to get another engineer. Uh, how do we do that? Who, you know, and you know, then we go through the whole cycle of getting people who have been dismissed from other jobs and are now kind of grumpy about the whole process and, and end up starting the whole cycle all over again by not being cooperative and having a chip on the shoulder when they come in the door because they fired the previous guy and now, you know, blah, 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 blah. So it's not, it kind of perpetuates. So we got to kind of change it in the middle. I, I wanted to put a question to, to Chris Tarr. Chris, you're, you're well respected at, at your station. I've seen you interact with uh, managers and, and other people at, at your station. What are a couple of the key things that you make sure you do? And they may be unconscious now. They may be such habit for you. But what do you do to, to show your value? Sure. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, part, number one, I mean, I've been, I was on the air for years, so I have a, a little dip, bit different personality than a lot of engineers out there. I remember talking to a, a GM who was uh, looking to hire an engineer and was calling around for references and talked to me for about five minutes and said, you know, you're a pretty funny guy. You know, have you ever thought about, uh, you know, taking a new job? Uh, you know, it was just a very enjoyable conversation. But, uh, you know, Terry hit a lot of those things right on the head. You know, I do uh, participate in all the department head meetings. I participate in the budgeting processes, and I try to really make sure that my general manager looks at me as, as an ally and, and somebody that he can go to for advice. Uh, you know, for example, when the vice president of engineering sends him surveys and, and things like that, he knows that he can give me a call and I'll come down the hall and, and help him solve those problems and fill those out. But you have to look at yourself as an enabler. And, and really my job is to make sure that everybody else can do theirs. And, and part of that is not saying no automatically to everything that comes by. You know, the, the program director comes in and says, oh, I want to do this and this. And, you know, generally the, the first response in the engineers for the eyeballs pop out and go, you want to do what? Uh, you know, uh, instead, you know, we work at it together and go, well, what are you trying to accomplish? And, and you know, I, I always like to, to tell my people, you know, there's, there's no such thing as no. It could be it's going to be too expensive. It could be that it's too difficult. It could be a pain in the butt. But anything's possible. And, and as long as you lay it out that way and say, well, you know, we could do that. Here are some of the pitfalls. And, you know, to be able to communicate that. And then, you know, another thing Terry brought up is, for example, when uh, transmitters go off the air, I document that. I email the general manager and the program director and go, hey, the transmitter's off. Here's what's going on. Uh, you know, if I, if I can, I'll take pictures of parts and send it to them, you know, show them the burned up stuff. They get really interested in that. When I bring them a handful of parts, I go, Hey, look at what burned up in the transmitter. They're fascinated. And all of a sudden, all that mysterious transmitter work becomes something concrete that they can see. And, and I, you know, they go from getting an email from me that something's broken to getting an email that it's fixed. And, you know, so all of a sudden when I'm gone, they, they know that I'm doing something productive. But the key is, is communication and, and interaction. And, you know, I, I see these guys every day. I interact with them. And I try to be the guy that makes things happen, not a roadblock to something they want to achieve. So, uh, you know, like I said, I know a lot of engineers who, you know, the automatic response, I still do it sometimes. I'm still guilty sometimes of going, oh, can't do that, you know, and then I'll give it 10 minutes and go back and say, well, you know what? Actually, I think we can. Here's, you know, here's a way we can do it. Uh, but in, instead of looking at, uh, you know, I think a lot, a lot of engineers still look at, you know, when somebody breaks something, that's a bad thing. 
And I look at it as it's a great thing because it's an opportunity for me to, to do what I do best. You know, I, I we have a, you know, somebody in a studio breaks a, a fader or something. Uh, you know, some engineers, oh, you were beating on it. Why were you beating on it? Be nice to that piece of equipment. And I go, hey, you know, no problem. If, if you guys didn't break stuff, I wouldn't be employed. So no, not a problem at all. And I think it's just all about how you approach it. That is, yeah, that is such a, a, yeah, hard to remember. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Terry. No, ahead. I was just going to say that uh, he has such a great attitude. I mean, he, he, the, let me tell you another thing that's really interesting about engineers. Um, one of the things that we have trouble with is change. Anybody have a problem <laughs> remembering that? We don't yeah. like change. You know why? We don't like change because whenever something changes, it means we have to do something. It's a change in the status quo, which requires a fixing or something, something has to be fixed. In other words, the most perfect world for the engineer is when nothing ever happens. It never breaks. Well, it's not, that's not going to happen. So change for us is a little, is uncomfortable. And who of, who of the people watching this right now have ever said, you know, the best, the best weekend is the one in which there are no pages. And that's a, that's a negative attitude. That's saying, you know, I'm on call and I don't like it and, you know, I hate it and yet I've got to do it. That's because something's changed. And now, so change is bad. Change means it's something out of my control, something I'm not used to, something I have to go outside myself and deal with. When it, wouldn't it be much better if everything just kept running the way, it, the way I wanted it to? So think about that as, as, as engineers not wanting to be change agents. And we maybe wanting to be change agents, but not liking change when it's imposed on them. And then look at it from the manager standpoint. What do you think a manager does? A manager is making change happen all the time. That's what they do. If they don't make change happen, nobody makes money. If nobody makes money, there's a new manager. So for a, for a manager, change is great. I mean, they don't they love change because it's excitement. It's new opportunities. It's new opportunities for making money. New opportunities for expanding the services and the audience. It's great. And the engineer, not so much. Change, not fun. Change, not good. And so you can see how those two personality traits absolutely will grind against each other because the manager will be wanting to do stuff all the time that's different. And the engineer will be thinking every time he wants me to do something, that's something else I got to deal with that I haven't planned on. So again, uh, one of the things we do as engineers is we don't like change. And that's why we get frozen in the time zone that we are in when we got into the business, because that's where we think we are. And that's where we think we have to be. We won't want to learn IT because my God, that's a whole new thing. I'm not sure I could even learn that. And that's a, that would be a huge change. And anyway, I like working on my cart machines and, uh, you know, uh, changing vacuum tubes in my AM transmitter, my one kilowatt AM vacuum tube transmitter, uh, and <laughs> loving my console with the, the nice warm tubes inside of it and all that stuff. Yeah. And because I can fix all that stuff and it's good. So I'm afraid to make that step. I'm afraid to take that step because it is a change and it's something I have to get outside myself. And a lot of engineers don't like that. They find that terribly uncomfortable. And so they resent it. So another thing to think about. This hour has uh, flown by and we've actually gone, gone over this hour. Terry, I, I hope you would come back and be with us again. I think we have oh, to talk about including, including uh, what engineers should be, should be thinking about. How do they prep themselves for the future? Whatever it is. I don't think we can predict the future, but we know it's going to be different than the present. Exactly. Exactly. Like, how do we stop ourselves from being frozen in 2010 or 2011 as we're moving in, you know, through the century? So interesting topic. Chris Tarr, thank you for being with us. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Thanks for having me once again. And uh, glad, uh, how, uh, glad things are good in Mukwanago and you're, uh, you're not snowed in. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Give it a couple of more. Actually, it's Wisconsin. Give it another couple of minutes and that can change. And uh, uh, congratulations. It's pretty good so far. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. haven't had snow yeah. yet. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, and Chris, congratulations on your purchase of the uh, of the Packers. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'm now, I, I'm now a team owner, which is nice. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> good for you. Terry, uh, thank you once again for being with us from uh, uh, Janesville, Wisconsin. Uh, I do hope you'll come back again. I, I appreciate yeah, it. Hey, Terry, I got one. 
I got one little job for you. At random, we give away a license of Omnia AXE to uh, yeah. someone who retweeted the fact that the, the show was starting about a, an hour ago. And we've got, uh, looks like, close to 20 people uh, who have retweeted. Yeah, we do have 20 that have retweeted. Give me a random number between 1 and 20, if you would, Terry. 19. Not, not 19. All right. That was, that would be, hang on. Let me count. There's 10. That's, obviously, I'm not very good at this. Okay. Uh, looks like, looks like Kenneth Webb. Kenneth Webb, and let's see what uh, Kenneth's uh, Twitter handle is. It is Kenneth W. from Australia. We've had a couple winners from wow. Australia. Ken, Kenneth Webb, congratulations. Uh, he's a, uh, according to his uh, uh, Twitter handle, he's a uh, Twitter profile. He's a uh, media producer of uh, video, web, and audio. So, Kenneth, I'll be contacting you, or you, maybe you can send me an email. Contact me. I'll send you a direct message or something, or you do the same to me. And we'll get in touch, and we'll get you your uh, license for Omnia AXE. All right. Terry, thanks for your help there. Appreciate it. Oh, and we You're have welcome. one more little job. We, we need a show title. Uh, show title. Did we have a moment of uh, clarity <laughs> during the show where we could <laughs> come up with a show title? And you know, Terry Bond is fine. That's our default. But uh, were there any were there any uproarious moments? Uh, we we're getting some uh, the IRC channel here. We got change is good is one. Uh, yeah, let's see what else. Yeah. Embrace change. <laughs> Midwest how, how, Mads. How, how how some engineers <laughs> handle or don't handle change. There you go. Something yeah. something along those lines would be useful. I think that's that's kind of the central message: is get used to it. Ooh, adapt or die. Is another get different. used to it. Right there. Oh, a, adapt or die. Well, yeah. Yeah, exactly was, right. Uh, I got to mention this one. Up. Are are broadcast engineers certifiable? <laughs> well, yes, that's absolutely that's been a question for some time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I like adapt or die. I think I think everybody responded favorably to that one. So thanks for the entries. The show number 109 will be called Adapt or Die. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate our sponsor, Omnia Audio, on the web at omniaaudio.com. You can go there, get white papers, read about the processors, and request yourself a beautiful coffee table full-color catalog of items from Telos, Omnia, and Axion. You will enjoy it. Share it with your friends and leave it out for your general manager uh, you know, with uh, the items that you want circled, and maybe you'll, you'll find them under the tree. All right. Thank you for joining us, chat room and everybody else, uh, for downloading and everything for uh, uh, joining us for This Week in Radio Tech. I appreciate you very much. I really do. Thank you for participating by watching and, and uh, being in the chat room and, and listening to our show and giving us feedback. Someone asked uh, Terry if we would post those uh, 10 items. Was it 10 items? Was it yeah, I, I, I don't know the legality of that, quite honestly, because I, I got them off the web. But, I mean, there's nothing sacred about those. Oh, ten there's nothing sacred, sacred there. Things. There, you know, so uh, I, if you like, I can uh, I can send it. I can send you the list if you like. Because um, there's a lot of text that goes with it, which I didn't talk, I didn't talk about. So. Gotcha. You let your conscience be your guide. If you, if okay. you think we should post it, uh, send it to us. Otherwise, okay. hey, just rewind the tape, folks, and listen again. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Oh, thanks, Brian. Appreciate you very much. And Burke teaching Brian on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.